So we've seen now how the first isomorphism theorem is plausible given reasoning from linear algebra that was very similar when we talked about the rank nullity theorem. So the reason that the first isomorphism theorem seems reasonable is that if I start with a homomorphism from g to h that's not necessarily an isomorphism, I can make it onto by restricting from h down to just the image of phi. Then by construction, we get something which is onto. And we can repair the fact that this isomorphism might not be one-to-one -one yet um, by instead of choosing the, all the elements from G to have their own individual images, we can reduce down to the cosets of G by the kernel of this transformation. Once we wipe out the kernel, then all the differences between elements matter in a way that creates not only an onto function, but a one-to-one -one and onto function, a bijection that respects the structure between the factor group G mod K and the image of the homomorphism phi that gives me an isomorphism between those two things, and that is the hidden isomorphism that the first isomorphism theorem gives us. Let's look at an example next, and then after that in the next video, we'll look at a proof for the first isomorphism theorem. So what's an example look like? I'm going to kind of reach a little bit uh, for this example, uh, but I'm going to do so, I think, in a way that uh, is going to illustrate why this is such an important and valuable thing. Let's take a look at the following function from the dihedral group of the hexagon, D6, into the symmetric group on four symbols, S4. And I'm going to define this function by sending the ith power of t composed with the jth power of r into the composition of the transposition 1, 2, i times, and 3, 4, j times. So here I have an element from the dihedral group of the hexagon. Here's the image as a product of two cycles inside of S4. So first of all, why should you even believe me that phi is a homomorphism to begin with? It's a valid question and something that we should probably check every time. So why does it satisfy, why does it respect the structure in these two groups? So if I have two elements of my dihedral group, if I have ti, rj, and then ti, rj, where the i's and j's are capitalized, um, I need to show that this is equal to phi of this one times phi of that one using the multiplication of the symmetric group. Well, there's sort of two cases here. In one case, I don't have any powers of t here, right? so I have the capital I is equal to zero. In that case, I just have t to the i times r to the little j plus big j. And by definition of my function, that's going to then be equal to 1, 2 to the power i, composed with 3, 4 to the power i plus j. But I can take the j plus j powers of 3, 4, and I can split them apart into a little j part and a big j part, and then just recognize that 1, 2 to the i, 3, 4 to the j is exactly phi of t to the i, r to the j, and 3, 4 to the j is exactly phi of r to the j, because i was equal to 0. That gives me exactly the product rule I was looking for. Now, what if i is equal to 1? I broke this out into two cases, because for the simplification in the dihedral group, it makes a big difference if I have a t here in the middle of my word versus if I didn't. If I didn't have a t in the middle of my word, I didn't have to do any tricky dihedral simplification. But if I do have a t in the middle of my word, now I have to do something uh, to simplify this expression that I have here. So if i is equal to 1, what I need to do before I can apply my function is push all my t's to the front of the line. And that means leapfrogging this t past little j numbers of rotations, little j numbers of r. And every time I leap it past an r, that r becomes its inverse on the other side of t. That's the relation in the dihedral group, remember. rt is equal to t r inverse. And so when I push this t to the front of the line past little j numbers of r's, those little j's are going to become minus little j powers of r. And at the front of the line, I'm now going to get t to the i plus 1. So t to the i plus 1, r to the minus j, r to the capital J. Simplify that out. That's r to the capital J minus little j. And now I can see how to apply my function. I'm going to get i plus 1 powers of 1, 2, composed with big J minus little j powers of 3, 4. Now to simplify this, we have to use some properties of the symmetric group. Namely, we need to use the fact that because 3, 4 is a transposition, its order is 2, and so it's equal to its own inverse. So having minus J powers of it is the same thing as having plus J powers of it. So I can make this J plus J. Similarly, because 1, 2, and 3, 4 are disjoint cycles, that means they commute with one another, which means that I can break apart the 1, 2 to the power i plus 1 into a 1, 2 to the i and a 1, 2 to the 1, and I can push that 1, 2 to the 1 past the first little j powers of 3, 4. To rewrite this thing as 1, 2 to the i, 3, 4 to the j, 1, 2 to the 1, 3, 4 to the big j. 
and that's exactly phi of t i r j, composed with phi of t to the big i r to the big j, and therefore the homomorphism property is satisfied. So we put in a lot of effort to figure out that this function that I'm trying to tell you about actually does respect the structure in these two groups. But that's important because if it doesn't, it can lead us to all sorts of wrong conclusions down the line. We really need these functions to be homomorphisms in order to get the abundance of information that the first isomorphism theorem is going to give us. All right, so now let's figure out what the first isomorphism theorem is actually going to do for us. If I look at all 12 elements of D6, and then all the elements of S4, of which there's 4 factorial, or 24. Um, the first thing that we notice is that there's really only a few elements that are going to matter inside of S4. So the identity element of D6 is going to get sent to the identity element of S4. That's a good sign. Remember, every homomorphism does that. Meanwhile, T, which is T to the, T to the 1, R to the 0, is going to get sent to the transposition 1, 2. R is going to get sent to the transposition 3, 4. And TR is going to get sent to the composition of 1, 2 with 3, 4. And what you'll notice is that none of the other elements in S4 are going to be hit by this homomorphism. So the image of this homomorphism consists only of those four elements of S4. When we figure out where all the rest of these go, they all go to those same four things. So the first key observation is that only the image of this homomorphism inside of S4 is going to matter. All the rest of these 20 other elements that belong to S4 but are not involved in this linear tra in this homomorphism, those are not going to tell us anything about anything. They're just sitting off there to the side. And so the first step that we think about in the first isomorphism theorem is restricting ourselves from the whole target group down to just the image. And when I reduce down to just the image, I'm now going to have a function which has a chance at being onto. The next thing we notice is that each of the elements in my image is getting hit the same number of times. Topologists call this a regular function. Every element has the same number of pre-images. Right? In this example, that's 3. Right? The identity element is coming from three different spots. 1, 2 is coming from three different elements. 3, 4 is coming from three places. The composition 1, 2, 3, 4 is coming from three places. And that's meaningful, because it turns out that each of those three element inverse images are a coset of the kernel of phi, the kernel of phi being the inverse image of the identity, namely e r squared r to the fourth. So e r squared and r to the fourth is the inverse image of the identity. It's got three elements in it. And all of the cosets of that kernel are all also going to the same spot. So 1, 2 is coming from three different elements, which are the coset by r of the kernel, and so on and so forth. So what this allows us to do is to bridge this divide between D6 and S4 by first taking a step back from the whole group S4 back to just the image, which consists of these four elements that are getting hit by my homomorphism. That gives me something which now is going to be allowed to be onto. And then by taking a step forward from my domain group into the quotient group by the kernel of this homomorphism. And that kernel is the three elements E, R squared, and R to the fourth. All three of those elements are getting mapped to the identity under this homomorphism. And therefore, if I look at the cosets of that kernel, because all the differences between elements of the same coset are accounted for by elements of the kernel, which phi erases, that means that all the elements in these cosets are all going to the same place, determined only by their coset, and not determined by which element within that coset we look at. So all three of these elements from the kernel get mapped to the identity. All three of these elements in t times the kernel are getting mapped to 1, 2. All three of the elements in R times the kernel are getting mapped to 3, 4. And all three of the elements in TR times the kernel are getting mapped to 1, 2 composed with 3, 4. And now, this function in the middle, this association of cosets of D6 by the kernel of phi with elements of the image of phi, that is an isomorphism. It's the hidden isomorphism inside of our homomorphism. And it shows me a couple of things. It shows me, first of all, that e r squared and r to the fourth, that's the kernel of this homomorphism and is therefore a subgroup, in fact a normal subgroup, of d6. So if I didn't know, for example, what normal subgroups of d6 might look like, this has now discovered one for me. It's the kernel of this homomorphism. And the second really cool thing that it does is it also tells me what the factor group of d6 by this normal subgroup actually looks like up to isomorphism. It looks like the elements, on the one hand, uh, identity, T, R, and TR inside of D6. 
On the other hand, it looks like the elements identity 1, 2, 3, 4, and the composition of 1, 2, 3, 4 inside of S4. And either which way you slice it, it's a group of order 4 that has one element of order 1, and the rest of the elements are all over 2. And so up to isomorphism, this is nothing more than the direct product of Z2 with Z2. So here the first isomorphism theorem has discovered for me a normal subgroup, that's this purple thing here, and it has also characterized for me the nature up to isomorphism of the factor group by that normal subgroup. That factor group is exactly isomorphic to the Klein 4 group Z2 plus Z2. So this is the power of the first isomorphism theorem. It lets us focus only on the parts of this homomorphism that matter the most. All the differences that didn't matter because they were accounted for by elements of the kernel, we wipe those out by passing to the factor group. And all those elements of H which didn't get hit by my original homomorphism, we get rid of those by focusing on just the image. And what's left over is a one-to-one -one onto function between the factor group and the image, which respects the algebraic structure of both, and therefore gives me an isomorphism. So this is an application of the first isomorphism theorem to tell me something about a normal subgroup of D6 and the quotient of D6 by that normal subgroup. In the next video, let's actually look at the proof in its full flower of the first isomorphism theorem.